right. Welcome, everyone, to another episode or, if you will, journal club on a very exciting topic, anterior canal BPPV treatment. And with us tonight, we have a very awesome, brilliant, special guest, Dr. Michael Teixeiro. So I'm going to let him further introduce yeah. himself a little bit here. Welcome, Dr. Teixeiro. Hi, Helena. It's great to be here. Um, I'm a neurotologist in uh, Wilmington, Delaware, and uh, been in practice for about 30 years. And I have a special interest in BPPV and, and in teaching about it because it's such, an, uh, such a common and uh, yet not very well treated uh, condition uh, yet. I think we have so much, uh, we've made a lot of progress in the last uh, couple of decades and having a much broader range of individuals who can treat this problem and but we still have a long way to go true true all right well uh tonight's article is on the short crp for anterior canal lithiasis a new maneuver based on simulation with a biomechanical model we're going to get right into the slides and talk about this condition so just to get everybody on the same page, opening up, talking about the vestibular system, what lives in our inner ear, and specifically that vestibular apparatus, which has three canals, and they're really great. They sense direction of movement, but unfortunately, little crystals can get into them that don't belong. This is what we call BPPV. So you can see the names of the three canals there. We'll talk more about the anterior canal shortly since that's the focus of our discussion. Just to get everyone again on the same page, what does BPPV mean? Benign means it doesn't hurt us, although I personally disagree on this matter as a physical therapist because I have had more than one patient fall and get hurt and the cause of their fall was BPPV. Paroxysmal, we know that this can be kind of sudden onset type of symptom and it can be recurrent positional we feel the symptoms of vertigo with the change in position of the head or body because the head moves with the body and vertigo is the sense of movement of the self or the environment also not so helpful because some of my patients deny anything remotely resembling this symptom and they just say they feel off but still when i test them I find that they have BPPV. So it is the name. We can't change the name. At least I can't. <laughs> um, but that's what we call this. So we know when the otoconia or these little crystals are displaced from kind of the center of this apparatus and move into one of these canals. Um, they send a false sense of movement when they shift in the canal. And so people might feel, again, vertigo, dizziness, nausea, off balance, anything like that. Now, anterior canal is relatively rare compared to the other canals. So most clinicians, which I think you might agree with me, Dr. Teixeira, would say, I know how to treat BPPV, but the only thing they really are comfortable treating is posterior canal, which is the majority, so that's worth something. <laughs> um, that's right. However, <laughs> it's not the whole picture. <laughs> so we see there's horizontal canal. That could be between any, depending on who you ask in the literature, 10 to 30% of cases. And our anterior canal between 1 and 3%. I think your article quotes 3%. Am I right there, Dr. Teixeira? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So that's what we see. Now, to find out if someone has BPPV, most clinicians out there say, I can test for that. I know how to do the dix hall Pike test, which is an appropriate test to try to identify BPPV in either the posterior or anterior canal. Um, and the, the steps are listed here. Turn the head 45 degrees towards the side you're testing. Lie the patient back as quickly as you can to try to get a little momentum going, allowing the head extended to 20, 30 degrees of extension and wait. Some people are not patient enough when they assess for BPPV as well, so we like to remind them to wait. Another test you could do is the head hang. And this is where the patient would sit in long sitting. You would have them lie back 
into supine and extend the head essentially as much as you can, as much neck extension as they have. And again, look for nystagmus and symptoms for at least a minute, I would say. So this is where our question comes up, Dr. Teixito. When you're testing, do you specifically do the head hang test or only in certain circumstances? What is your feeling on that? Um, I always do the the Dix Hall Pike maneuver, but I do a modification, and uh, that's called the expanded Dix Hall Pike maneuver. When I do, um, I, I usually take the patient down with the head to one side, but only to horizontal, because that will um, allow me to see posterior canal uh, nystagmus, but it's not at horizontal deep enough to have any anterior canalithiasis um, interfere. And then if the horizontal is positive or negative, then I can hang the head all the way down 30 or 40 degrees below horizontal, you know, whatever the patient can tolerate. And then uh, if anterior canalithiasis is present, it'll, it'll present at that point. So usually I always, uh, you know, the challenge is when patients don't have enough head, uh, neck uh, extension to, to really hang below. Uh, so yes, I do uh, uh, try to hang uh, down below and uh, I usually, I'm testing both sides, but uh, as you may know from the article, uh, people thought it made a big difference which side you were head hanging your head on. Uh, when you did the head hang test. And after a while, they said, you know what? It doesn't matter if it's, uh, so if somebody described a maneuver that started with the head turned to the affected side. And then somebody said, oh no, my maneuver is head turned away from the affected <laughs> side. And um, then somebody described a maneuver that said, hey, listen, put it in the middle. It takes away the whole problem of trying to figure out which side is the involved side. Uh, which really is a godsend that uh, because it can be hard to tell, as you, I'm sure you're going to talk about. Indeed, indeed. Now you make some excellent points. So it's an interesting approach because uh, is that officially described in the literature, or that's your definitely your personal experience coming into play there, where you kind of stop at this kind of horizontal plane before you would drop into extension? Yeah, it's actually uh, uh, very well. Uh, it's written up, and it's called the expanded Dix Hall Pike maneuver. So you start, uh, you, you with the head to the right side or left, you go down to horizontal, you observe, then you um, turn the head to the left, to the opposite side in horizontal. So you're testing the one posterior canal. And you know, so if your head's to the right, you can only get uh, a stimulation from the posterior canal on the right because the, the opposite posterior canal is parallel to the earth. And then you can, without sitting up, turn the head 90 degrees. And if there's posterior canalithiasis on the other side, you'll have an isolated response from that canal. If you go directly to head hanging, the reality is that if you have bilateral posterior canalithiasis, um, both canals will get stimulated with varying intensities and time courses. And that's where, you know, there's a conflict between what we think we knew in black and white and the this mess that we, sometimes we see in the clinic. So the, the idea was to, uh, you, know, you turn, so you go to horizontal to one side, then the other side to test the posteriors, and then you hang the head. Once again, without even sitting up, you just go from horizontal to head hanging on one side, then the other uh, to uh, evaluate for anterior canalithiasis. Got um, it. So that, the, the, the whole idea was to try to allow time to do what it's supposed to do. And that's to keep everything from happening all at once. Yes. And is there any chance of if there's horizontal canal involvement, could that get stimulated in that process? Oh, well, absolutely. But once again, as soon as you, uh, you, you kind of learn, uh, uh, it, once you're turning from side to side, then um, you've already started. If you see horizontal uh, uh, nystagmus, then you're already, by turning to the opposite side, starting a supine 
role test. Right. So, that's what that's what kind of I pictured in my head a little bit. So, like... so you so you're so you're jumping right into it. You're saying, okay, well that's one side. Let's see if it reverses, and then you're just you, you. I don't have people sit up and say, okay, we did the diagnostic part. Now we're going to do the therapeutic part that you have to sit up in between. We just once you're down there, we. Um, kind of learn to learn to drive from where we are. Got it. Got it. No, I think that's great because it does, you know, that multiple position change issue for people with their low back issues and um, just the symptom stimulation of going up and down. I mean, I guess the only thing you would maybe lose would be some people like to have somebody sit up to see if they get the reversal. I don't know that you see that as being very important, though. Oh, well, it is very important with, and if somebody has anterior canalithiasis. So I'm glad that you brought that up because uh, one of the things that makes uh, anterior canalithiasis so difficult to treat is that a lot of it is not anterior canalithiasis. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. It's actually <laughs> posterior canalithiasis, but it is, uh, there are otoliths which get stuck on the apex of the posterior canal. And when we hang the head extremely, they fall into the canal, not away, you know, toward the ampulla. And that gives this downbeat rotary nystagmus to the affected side that we in would interpret as an anterior canal response from that ear. And only by sitting up and looking for the reversal and testing again, can we say, oh, it's gone. And did you just fix the anterior canalithiasis or now it just looks like routine posterior canalithiasis? <laughs> and, uh, mo and very often um, uh, it was really posterior canalithiasis all along. Some people call it common cruis disease uh, when you have otolis there. Uh, but it, it may explain why um, people say that uh, the, uh, the, some people have said that the incidence is you know really high you know ten percent instead of uh, an actually three percent, and it may explain a little bit too why it's so hard to treat because I think some of the people uh, didn't realize that they were trying to treat something that wasn't ever going to respond to maneuvers specific for anterior canalithiasis. So you know treatment success is only about seventy five percent for anterior canal, for most anterior canal maneuvers. And uh, this distinction about having otoliths that are on the apex of the canal uh, uh, wasn't really made until a few years ago. Got it. So then the order in assessment would be head to horizontal, doing your expanded Dix Hall Pike, and then before you treat, you do have them sit up or you're just saying you look for the reversal when you bring their head back up from the hang position, which do you mean? If there? I think, well, well, what I'm saying is that if I, during that maneuver, I, I would, if I, uh, so say a patient comes and they have anterior canalithiasis, I would take them down to horizontal on one side and nothing would happen. I would turn the head 90 degrees uh, to the other side, and still nothing would happen. I just tested both posterior canals, and because there was no horizontal nystagmus, I know there's no horizontal canal disease. But then I go hanging the head 30 to 40 degrees, and now something's happening. I'm now I'm getting the uh, uh, this downbeat nystagmus and. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if they actually have uh, anterior canal. I think they have anterior canalithiasis. So I do sit them up when the response is over to look for a reversal and then um, test them again. And on the second time down, if they if it was this common cruise posterior canalithiasis, I'll see only posterior canalithiasis. And, um, but if it was really anterior canalithiasis, I'll see the, the anterior canalithiasis response a second time. So Got you want to see that it's a, per, you, you want to see if it's a persistent response. Got it. 
because it probably wouldn't fatigue in just two tests worth, because that's something people worry about sometimes with repeat testing, right? That is true. Yeah, that's right. So um, uh, that is, I, I, I think that uh, the second time is probably, uh, it, it, most of the time it's okay. Got it. No, I think that makes sense. All right. Oh, I love it. Okay. So just because we got to talk about nystagmus when we talk about BBBV, <laughs> we've already mentioned it a little bit. I just wanted to give everybody a visual on types of nystagmus we might see uh, with anterior canal. So it's been described in the literature as either having this downbeating and torsional component towards the affected ear or downbeating vertical with minimal or no torsion. So a uh, question to you, have you seen both? Well, yes, and the, the, the reality is that uh, um, it's, it is difficult to always see the torsional component in an anterior canal response. So uh, in order to answer this, I'd love to show you a, a brief animation of Ewald's law uh, and the generation of the rotary eye movement. So I'm gonna share my screen and show you a little video. I hope you can see that well. Yes. So what we're looking at here is a right labyrinth. And uh, this is the anterior canal in blue, the utricle in red, the horizontal canal is red and the posterior canal is uh, in green. And this is the membranous labyrinth, you know, not the bony semicircular canals. The utricle here is, uh, the macula of the utricle is shown in white. Now, if you um, imagine that this anterior canal is a bicycle tire and it has an axle, uh, you would transpose the axis of that axle over onto the eye. And that is very near the equator of the eye. And that means uh, the, the, that the eye is going to rotate about that axis when otoliths are moving and falling through the canal. So if otoliths are falling in the head hanging position from here up to the apex of the canal, that means the eye is gonna be dragged in the direction of the otolith movement, and then it's going to correct with a downbeat that's fast. And it's going to rotate toward the right eye, toward the right side, toward the right side, the right anterior canal. So let's look at the animation. Slow phase, fast phase, slow phase, fast phase, slow phase, updrift, and fast phase. Now this animation is a little bit inaccurate because the eye doesn't really go up as far as I'm showing. It comes up until uh, about half of this iris is hidden behind the, the upper lid and then snaps back down. And because the, ax uh, uh, so it's really kind of hard to see the rot rotary component. And that's not true of the posterior canal. The posterior canal axis is much higher. Mm -hmm. So when the eye goes down and then snaps up, it's easier to see this rotary component you know, in posterior canalithiasis than for anterior canalithiasis. So it can be really sneaky. So what can you do to actually see this rotary component better? Mm -hmm. Well, if the patient has a prolonged response, what you do is have them look away you have them look to the right and to the left. So if the patient looks, to say, to the, to the right side, so imagine the eye turns this way and it's still rotating about an, this, an axis over here, then all you're gonna see you're, is, is the downbeat nystagmus. But if the eye turns the other direction and they're looking directly into the axis, you're gonna see only the rotary component. And that way you can be sure there is a rotary component and that uh, that rotary component is um, 
associated with if, if it if it's visible when they're looking to the left into the axis then you know it's the right anterior canal it's a great and tip if it's visible yeah so this is the way to do it and if you have a prolonged response it's great for posterior canal lithiasis too next time you have a patient with a prolonged response have them look to the right and to the left and when they look over to toward the wall uh they are to, to try to gaze toward the floor they they're gazing right into the axis of the posterior canal and you see the the, the rotary component very uh, boldly mm -hmm. So this is the way that I think you can be really sure that there actually is a, a posterior, a, you know, a rotary component. And, you know, as you mentioned, you know, a lot of people have a, a posterior canal disease, but there are a lot of other reasons to have downbeat nystagmus. You know, there's central compression and people have medication effects. Um, you know, you, you know, people get to have Chiari malformations and mm -hmm. they compress the cerebellar tonsils. They'll get downbeat. They'll, they'll get it after head shake and head extension. Um, so not all downbeat nystagmus is anterior canalitis, but seeing the rotary component is um, really confirmatory. Definitely, definitely. And I've used gaze definitely to draw out nystagmus, but I think it's good it's a good reminder with with your illustration there from your BPPV viewer because it really helps to kind of link everything with those visuals for folks. So that's really helpful. If you have if you have the ability to record on your infrared lenses, and for those individuals who are watching who may not uh, really be l using infrared lenses, they allow you to see an enormous amount of eye movement, and that you're you're not going to achieve the ability to interpret eye movements without this special piece of equipment. And uh, when you uh, do use them, you can um, see uh, just about everything you need to and you can record. So if you have a confusing case, you can record it and you can have people uh, gaze to the right and left during a prolonged response. And uh, you can look at it later yourself or with a colleague and say, oh, you know what, I think I, I realize what they have. I just couldn't come up with it in real time. And that's something I've done numerous times because it takes time to get fast and to be able to interpret things instantly. Absolutely. No, I mean, I've been looking at eyes now for many years and it's still every once in a while you want at least I want to play it back for myself again and because maybe it happened quickly and I'm like oh, is that what I thought I saw you know just being able to do that let alone uh you know talk through cases with folks is invaluable yeah and then say. if you and if you think you saw something then you can now there's enough information on YouTube and people are sharing their recordings and you can say okay yeah there's another case and there's another case they look like the same thing now I'm sure right pattern recognition no, no. Yeah, that's right <laughs> <laughs> that's key all right practice practice all right so you brought this up before i even had a chance so thank you for that uh, this kind of uh um kind of topic of the the downbeat nystagmus being a, a variant of posterior canal bpv i think i first heard uh janet helminski speak on this a few years ago and she has a an article or two on it out there i think um, and we'll talk about treatments shortly. She had recommended using uh, the deep head hang to address it because it didn't really matter whether it was posterior canal variant or anterior canal that it would clear either way with that. But we'll talk about pros and cons to different maneuvers shortly. Uh, but enough to say that, you know, this is in the literature. It's well supported uh, that it, it exists and it's out there and it makes sense. Um, and you know, it's still, it really BPPV. does make sense, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, it is, it is BPPV and it, it does make sense because the posterior canal is a little different than the other canals. And if you look at your illustration there, uh, it's almost as though the posterior canal is a little elongated. There's this long flat segment behind, in the floor of the canal behind the ampulla. And there is an elongated, curvature over the top of the canal. 
So there is a, a more of an opportunity for Otolis to sit on that elongated curvature at the top. Indeed. So yes, good to point that out. Also, you've already pointed out this kind of central uh, or you know side effect of medication, other causes um, of downbeat nystagmus that we mustn't neglect. I've had, you know, a few enthusiastic clinicians that I've known. They'd be like, oh, I think I saw anterior canal BPP. And I'm like, you might have, but. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I had a few things and I'll see what you think about these. What I ha okay. have seen is a pattern. Um, if it's central um, downbeat, one of the things I've seen is it tends to be persistent and they are less likely to be what I would call symptomatic. Like I've put somebody in a Dix Hall Pike or a deep head hang and I'm seeing this downbeat nystagmus. I'm like, how you feel? And they're like, feel fine. <laughs> um, That's is that, right. And you're is that saying, your and you're thinking, <laughs> exactly. You, you, you're thinking you've got to be kidding. That, <laughs> you're really going there. Uh, so that's true. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's yeah. a very persistent response that stays, uh, that usually doesn't uh, fatigue away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a, so one person had MS, so, you know, anything goes as far as that. Uh, they can have a lot of vestibular findings in my experience. Um, but I've had people with MS who also had BBBV, so that's not fun for them, <laughs> let me tell you. No, that's, that's bad. Yeah. yeah. And some of the people who have, the, have central nystagmus, they may... Um, interestingly, you'll uh, elicit it and they'll get a downbeat nystagmus and then you sit them up and the exam is essentially over and they still have a little ongoing downbeat nystagmus and they're still asymptomatic. Uh, and you said, you said, you know, I, I didn't think that you had any nystagmus in neutral gaze before we started, but we kind of... Uh, lit up some circuitry that's yep. taking a while to <laughs> calm down. Yeah. Yeah. I always say, oh, I got something talking. <laughs> so, you know. That's right. That's right. Right. All right. So that can definitely happen. All right. Other things you might see in someone with a central issue. So you see this downbeat in Dick's hall pike or a deep head hang. You think it might be anterior canal, but hopefully ahead of your positional testing, because that's usually how I order things. You might have seen some other central signs. So... If you're seeing other central signs, especially if you know they have a history of migraine or something else that might kind of lend itself to possible uh, central nystagmus in positional testing, uh, just kind of take note of that. And then uh, the use of the visual fixation light. So I would say almost always if I find what seems to be a central positional nystagmus and I put on my visual fixation light, it doesn't really change the nystagmus. Has that been your experience as well, Dr. Teixeira? Yeah. And the fixation light, uh, just for everyone who's watching, it doesn't stop nystagmus, but you can definitely tell that it gets attenuated uh, when fixation is, is uh, available to a patient by turning on the fixation light. So it's not as completely on and off as uh, you would like. There are a couple of examples of that um, out there, but it, it is not usually, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier, we learn in black and white and the world is gray. <laughs> so true. Um, yeah. yeah. So on the flip side, if, if it is anterior canal BBV, I'd say the few cases I've had, um, which is probably 3% of my cases, so <laughs> still a few, but not not the majority. Sure. Uh, usually they have some vertigo or some sort of symptom that they report that kind of matches up with when the nystagmus is present, and then they diminish and go away, usually actually 5 to 15 seconds, but under a minute for sure. I don't, I've definitely not seen anything. Uh, it can have a latency sometimes. Um, and then again, if I, if, if, if it lasts long enough that I have a chance to flip on the light, if I'm unsure, I'll usually see that have an impact, uh, to diminish the strength of the nystagmus in those cases. So, um, yeah. Yeah. And then like you're saying, you would want to do gaze. Here's a question. If it's a centrally, uh, related, positional nystagmus that's a downbeat what happens with gaze then do you still draw out torsion when they gaze a certain way what might that look like 
Uh, it's possible, but uh, because every ampulla has its central circuitry that could be affected by a variant of a central nystagmus. But, you know, every um, uh, actual canalithiasis is, has a, a reversibility. Uh, you know, the, the hallmark of real uh, disease in the labyrinth is that, an uh, otolith disease is that the response reverses when sitting up, when rolling to the other side. And uh, you can see, uh, but, but the central uh, phenomena rarely reverse. Got it. Good point. I will add that to my list later. Reversibility, also key. Very good. All right, so we've kind of alluded to this BPPV viewer. I want to discuss it a little more formally. Um, so you talk about this in the article, although not by name <laughs> uh, so much, but it is a 3D model uh, that you were key in developing to study otolith disease. Um, mm -hmm. And in the case of the article, it was utilized to visualize the treatments of anterior canal thiasis. Uh, by studying the expected olive positions and different phases of different maneuvers, particularly the canal repositioning maneuver. So before we kind of get dig into the details of the article a little more as far as the, the short CRP, um, I do want to learn a little more about kind of the background of the BPP viewer, uh, why you developed it, um, kind of what was your experience and what gonna drove you to develop it well i think i'm a, a visual learner and i've always uh, thought that a great illustration has a great impact and uh, one of the great uh, challenges in treating bppv and interpreting eye movements is getting a really great 3d um, uh, concept of the position of the canals in in the human head and so I thought with today's technology, it should be possible to build a viewer uh, that really focuses on the membranous labyrinth. And uh, there were some digital models that were built uh, with uh, funding uh, from the National Library of Medicine. The, the, the best and first one was the downloadable temporal bone or the EPL viewer from the Eaton Peabody Lab uh, in, at Harvard. And uh, uh, Charlie Lieberman and his colleagues there uh, developed uh, a, a, a viewer that was uh, made from histologic sections of a temporal bone. And those um, microscope slides were all digitized in high resolution. And then the, that image stack was uh, collated and aligned so that each image aligned perfectly on top of the next one as, as perfectly as possible in a digital format. And then you go through the stack um, and trace an individual structure, say the facial nerve or the, maybe the membranous labyrinth on every slice and build a map of it. And uh, you can end up with a good model. Well, no one had ever done a really good um, model of the uh, labyrinth for study of otolith disease and a lot of these temporal a lot of temporal bones are actually missing the apex of the anterior canal uh, because when we fix temporal bones uh, it takes about 18 months of work to decalcify them and to get the microscope slides out of them for study um, but we want the formalin to get in there right away so we preserve all the structures so, so they usually cut off the top of the temporal bone where the anterior canal is. I mean, everybody thought that, well, it's just a tube at the top and we'll just cut it off and let the formal in it. <laughs> and then we discovered anterior, you know, superior canal dehiscence syndrome and now we have anterior canal thiasis. So I looked for a bone and uh, uh, Rindy Northrup of the Temporal Bone Foundation in Boston had a collection with a bone that had an almost completely intact anterior canal. And we um, uh, did the, you know, we segmented that particular uh, labyrinth for this model. And then we uh, assembled it. And then we colored each canal separately. We segmented the otolith organs. We took away the 
saccule because it doesn't play a role in otolith disease. We took away the endolymphatic sac and duct because it doesn't play a role. And we stylized it, you know, we smoothed it and it made it um, uh, clear for study. And then we, we only had one side. So we cloned it and made an, uh, um, a, a left hand of it. And then we positioned it uh, according to, uh, in relation to a digitized skull, which came from an MRI uh, of, a, of a patient and uh, according to known uh, orientations of the canals that was done very nicely by the group at Johns Hopkins. So uh, the, we then had the basis of a viewer and uh, just built the tools that allow you to move the head and the labyrinths around together as a unit in increments, uh, in any increment you want, and uh, in a way that you could record any unique position with X, Y, Z coordinates. And uh, this allows you to, because of gravity is present, you can turn on gravity and see what happens when you put other lifts in certain positions or do certain maneuvers. And um, uh, you can use this to make very, very good illustrations that are really clear. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of the illustrations that are in the BPPD literature are unfortunately um, just purely conceptual and they don't relate to the actual anatomy of the membranous labyrinth. But there are actual features of the anatomy of the membranous labyrinth, which have a great bearing on the clinical disease that we treat. And uh, especially with the lateral canal, uh, we can see the, you know, we can make some distinctions about where otoliths come to rest and how we treat and what we see clinically. Uh, just by looking at the membranous labyrinth, and it's not evident when you look at the bony labyrinth. So that was the idea of it, and it's free, and uh, people can uh, use it to make illustrations for articles and things like that. And uh, uh, and just so that when one person is talking to another and they have an idea, they can very clearly demonstrate it to them, what they're thinking to anyone else. Yeah, I mean, I think it's highly valuable uh, on multiple levels. And, and certainly I would recommend anyone, uh, whether they be very experienced or new, uh, to explore it. It's free. It's really, uh, very comprehensive. And, you know, if you're new and you just want to take a little bit of look at it at a time and try to kind of digest it and then come back to it, that could be, you know, valuable for sure. Uh, because uh, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. So since videos are made up of many pictures, <laughs> then you've got a lot of a lot of words there. Um, but it really kind of just puts the pieces together. So um, it's it's fantastic, and um, it's utilized here in this article. So we're ready to talk about the article a little more as far as treatments that are discussed in this article. And the first one, of course, is our classic traditional standard cantilever repositioning maneuver uh, previously named the modified Epley um, and one reason that it is popular is because it's been around a while it's familiar people know how to use it to treat posterior canal um, and you know it it's able to be modified so you discuss a little bit in your article about um, improving the results with a deeper neck extension for position two and as so far as using it to treat anterior canal, uh, BPPV, yeah. right? So cons, however, as far as using it for anterior canal are that if the chin is tucked in position four, um, you could have the otoliths uh, kind of go backwards, if you will, into the anterior canal away from where we want them to go. <laughs> um, and that upon sitting up, if the chin is tucked in this position, you could have those otoliths just kind of revert back uh, away from the utricle, essentially. Uh, do I have that that's right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. And a lot of people do. Um, uh, it, when you're treating posterior canal disease, when you sit up at the end, I, I think it's nice to tip the head mm -hmm. forward about 30 or 40 degrees because the posterior canal or the common cruise 
through which the otoliths are falling is actually angulated in a posterior direction right, about 40 right. degrees. And that brings the common cruise vertical. Right. And uh, so, um, but that does it, but that uh, is a mistake with uh, treating the anterior canal. Right. Because if you have the patient with their head, and there's a tendency to tuck the head, mm-hmm. uh, when a patient, because patients can't move their neck very well, you roll them on their side and the CRP and they can't really turn, um, you know, toward the floor. So they're, they're tucking their head in order to accomplish it. And uh, if they um, are moving otoliths toward the back into the anterior canal, and then you sit up with your head tucked, well, then you're going to reload the anterior canal, which was just liberated. You know, right. Of the degree. Now it's so unli- that is one of the things. Yeah. So we don't want it to be unliberated. <laughs> All right. That's right. So of course, uh, you do discuss the deep head hang maneuver or slash Yakovino. You hear it both ways. Um, traditional Yakovino, you'll see described here. Uh, for those who are not familiar. Um, so you're bringing the person again into that more neutral, almost kind of like the start of your test, right? That deep head hang position is kind of that deep head hang test. Kind of yeah. having them back in that, leaving them there for, depends on who you ask, 30 to 60 seconds, possibly three minutes. <laughs> it's like you have different variations well, ori- there, right? It was, orig- it was originally ours. <laughs> in the, the prolonged, the first paper, uh, there was a, it was an inpatient. You had to admit the patient to the hospital, and they took hours in each position. And uh, and it was amazing, impressive to people. And uh, then there was kind of a race to see. Well, maybe it works with less than hours. So <laughs> it went all the way down to thirty seconds per position. <laughs> yes, and, and, with, and, and still worked. Yes, right. So anyway, somewhere in there should be enough time to get this. <laughs> What a cone yeah. to move, right? Um, and then tucking that head up and then having them come to sit, right? Um, That's so, right. So pros to this, you don't have to be absolutely certain which side is the affected side. So if for some reason you're sure it's anterior canal BBV, but you're just not getting that torsion and even with gaze, you're unsure, I guess. Um, this is kind of your... Uh, I thought they called the gunshot. Like, <laughs> just gonna go for it. Mm-hmm. All right, let me see if this will clear it, kind of thing. Um, yeah. And it has been shown, at least by Janet Helminski's work so far, uh, to seem to be effective for that possible short arm posterior canal BPPV as well, because you're gonna kind of dump it out, I guess. Um, cons: you are bringing them to a bit more neck extension. Some people don't have that range. Um, and that three minutes version, there are people who will not tolerate that, that I know my patient group, I don't know who tolerated the hours, but I tell you some of my people will not tolerate three minutes either, especially with neck because neck extension is not the most comfortable for my folks with like some version of DJD, whatever, like, you know, they just don't tend to love extension in my experience. Is that something that you have found as well, Dr. Teixeira? Well, absolutely, and that's the one of the things that you know, why we have a lot of variations of maneuvers. Uh, basically, you need to find a maneuver that the patient can perform, and everyone and there are limitations, uh, in, uh, big limitations in uh, patient mobility. So, uh, I, you know, I like to tell people that they need a, a, a variation for the very mobile patient and the variation for the patient who is very immobile and mm-hmm. uh, for each uh, canal. And so for the posterior canal, that would be the CRP. It takes a lot of mobility to be able to do that. A large person has a hard time doing a CRP, especially in an exam chair. In a physical therapy office, you at least have a large um, you know, treatment table that's wide and you can literally roll the patient. Uh, around, but uh, a lot of people in an exam chair, uh, they can't perform a CRP. So if they're large, then we use a cement, which even for a large person, you can usually uh, perform a cement um, uh, successfully. 
-hmm. For the lateral canal, we use the log roll, but once again, that can be uh, difficult. And uh, then the Griffoni is a nice option for the less mm -hmm. mobile patient. And for the anterior canal, um, we um, have to try to use the, uh, the Yakovino, but not everyone can hang their head. And as we mentioned, it can be hard for a lot of people to, um, to roll uh, completely too. So shortening the, the roll required in the CRP uh, can make it easier for those patients. Mm -hmm. Very good. Good point. Be flexible, have options. <laughs> That's right. right. Good. So here's where... Um, uh, I wanted to talk about the modified Yakovino. So this came up because I was looking at another article, which we'll talk more about shortly by Bandari et al., which I imagine you're familiar with from 2021. Um, and she demonstrates this one. This one was new to me. It's a little bit different. And her demonstration is as follows of it. So the person is going into 30 degrees extension. Mm -hmm. And they say there for what I presume to be 30 seconds to a minute. <laughs> it does not state that specifically in the video. Um, and then they bring them up fully. And then they leave them there for what I'll call 30 seconds to a minute. And then they have them tuck their head down into flexion after mm -hmm. that. to happen here uh, about 45 degrees flexion is this familiar to you yeah. dr Tate? so that's uh sure uh, it is the question is um how reliably can you get the otolis over the apex of the canal uh, so i think that you might uh, prevent a little bit of conversion to the posterior canal but you may also uh, have a little bit of decreased efficacy in some patients because not everyone is gonna be able to get those otoliths over the top. Mm -hmm. I've studied this uh, with the Simant maneuver, uh, you, you know, doing a technical analysis uh, using my, my viewer. And uh, you really need to go, you, know, you, you can't just move 180 degrees and expect the otoliths to move 180 degrees. You have to over move the uh, patient to get the, um, the desired amount of otolith movement around the circumference of the canal. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I have a question here, you know, especially if you're uh, just uh, lying, going from sitting to lying down, that's uh, 90 degrees plus 30. So you have 120 degrees of movement and uh, the question is, is that really enough to get over the apex? It's something that this is the kind of uh, problem that you can do an analysis of using my model mm -hmm. and um, uh, try to draw, make a hypothesis about it. And then, uh, then you have a hypothesis and see if clinically that hypothesis can be supported and, uh, or, or not. And so it's a nice to see if whether or not model predictions can uh, really guide clinical practice. And if they don't, then uh, there's something that we don't know. You know, we, we need better explanations. Right. No, and I think that was kind of, yeah, an interesting point to me. I, I mean, I appreciated that uh, the concern about canal switch to posterior canal, um, which was their kind of argument that this was maybe somehow superior to the traditional uh, Yakovino. Uh, maybe I haven't seen enough anterior canal to see a switch. <laughs> I've not had that happen to me, but I guess I haven't had that well, many cases. Have you had a yeah, switch? Yeah, that's it. I, not that I recognized as a switch. So you're talking about a rare occurrence in a rare condition. <laughs> so we're still, we're getting to, uh, uh, to, uh, something that is, uh, uh, theoretical. You just have to be able to, there, there must be a clinic somewhere with it. 
people. I, I don't think there is a clinic anywhere that sees just an enormous <laughs> amount of uh, Unless they're putting them all. Lithiasis. They're, they're rolling maybe, them over maybe, in the car. Like, get them some rollovers so we get some anterior canal PPP. Well, someplace where there's a lot of yoga and everyone that has migraine and does the down dog <laughs> position every day, uh, then they could get like an epidemic of anterior there canal you go. Biases, right? there you Because go. you have a much higher, seven and a half times higher incidence of migraine, of BPPD and patients with migraine who are more prone to do yoga. And now... The down dog really is the is the great maneuver for loading the anterior canal. Yes, I've had more than one anterior canal case that the yoga seemed to be the culprit. I will say <laughs> that. <laughs> oh, but it's otherwise very good for you. Don't stop doing yoga just because of this <laughs> video, just to be clear. <laughs> Absolutely not. No. Oh, all right. So anyway, um, we're going to move on to the next slide here and talk about the short CRP, which is the real focus of this article at the end. Um, so this is a kind of a modification, we would say, of the traditional CRP that um, you came up with. And uh, pros are definitely that in position four of the CRP is omitted so that we kind of get rid of that risk of chin talk related treatment failure. We're not tucking the chin there and we're not tucking the That's chin right. when we come up. Um, it's simpler than the regular CRP and just, you're just omitting a step. You're, and otherwise it's, it's kind of still familiar, right? So it's got that kind of ring that's of right. and familiarity. So, so in that, <laughs> that's right. But you're also not having to roll the patient over onto their shoulder and which is something that's really hard for some people to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you imagine you're just having the patient sit up, you're lying down with their head extended and then turning to the opposite side and then you're sitting them up again. Right, right back and that until... is, uh, that, that's much, much more doable. That's mm -hmm. something that you can do in an exam chair uh, and, or in a narrow bed rather than uh, needing a big extra wide treatment table. Right. No need to roll over and have that extra position change of the body. Gotcha. Um, so uh, I guess a mild con is, again, people who are unsure about the affected side, um, you know, would be guessing, That's I guess, right. if they kind of pick a side to treat and see what happens, which, you know, I suppose yeah. everyone's done that now sometimes, and then. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you have a guess because you're doing head shake nystagmus and you can see that they have a compensated weakness on one side. Uh, or an obviously injured labyrinth, you know, that there's, a, you know, they have an ear that is, uh, has uh, high drops or something like that. And you mm -hmm. say, okay, I think you have anterior canalithiasis. It's pro most likely the sick ear. Yep. Uh, or they had a little posterior canalithiasis in the same ear. And it's more likely that they have uh, multi-canal disease in the same ear than uh, different canals into opposite ears right and this brings up a great point because i've seen a lot of clinicians struggle with this just confirm for me um that a person could have bbbb in any canal on a side that has a hypofunction true or false absolutely yeah so i think yes. some people think hypofunction means zero gone that side doesn't have any input what is your two That's cents right. on that? Tell us more. Well, um, you know, I think that people get confused sometimes with thinking that uh, you know, after the system compensates, you're um, going to have uh, no resting nystagmus and bias between the ears. And you're still going to have Ewald's second law in in effect. So you're still going to have a stronger um, response with stimulation uh, in the in, in, you know, toward the, or away from the utricle, depending on which canal it is. So it's a relative response to, for a single canal. And it doesn't matter whether it is a weaker canal or a stronger, uh, in, a, in a weakened labyrinth or in, a, in an intact labyrinth, uh, that that's happening. Right. So in other words, in someone who has a right hypofunction, they can still have BBBV 
in the right posterior canal or in the right horizontal canal and you can still see that on your exam and the patient can still have symptoms. Absolutely, yes. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And so they may have a hypofunction. The question is how weak, how great is their hypofunction? So just because the labyrinth is 35 or 40% weaker than the other side doesn't mean that it is incapable of generating a response. Uh, BPPV, the, you know, the, the response of BPPV is so robust in many patients that, you know, the, it's always been said that vestibular suppressants just don't help. Um, it, it, it's not, it doesn't help you to uh, dampen the vestibular response very much uh, when the response is so strong. So it's not going to, uh, uh, so even in a weakened labyrinth, uh, that's, you know, you know, 50%, uh, caloric weakness, uh, you're going to get a robust response that uh, the patient can feel. You know, when we do genomycin labyrinthectomy for patients with Meniere's disease, we generally try to get up to about an 80% labyrinthine weakness and that's we finally get to that level of weakness and then they stop having uh, problematic uh, responses good point but that's but that but, but that, that's nearly a dead labyrinth uh, right 80 percent weak right right but and most people, people can... with a weak go ahead you know, mo most people with a weak labyrinth don't have a dead labyrinth right right that's that's not it, it does exist, right? But it's it's more rare. Sure. I mean, and think about it. If a person gets a vestibular neuronitis and their labyrinth just shuts down from a virus, viral neuronitis, for a few hours, they have a 100% weakness. But they, uh, the, the most traumatic portion of their neuronitis resolves and they may end up with that, ep um, with a 40% weakness after the whole episode is finished and compensated, and that'll be with them forever. Uh, but they, there's a big difference between the symptoms generated by a 100% uh, shut shutdown and uh, only a 40% shutdown. Definitely. All right. So in conclusion, as we're getting towards the end here, because time is already almost over, which is crazy because this is awesome. Um, <laughs> we know that model analysis um, can help to demonstrate possible increased efficacy um, of the short CRP over the standard uh, CRP. And model analysis definitely uh, is a valuable exercise for examining the existing BPPV treatments out there. And hopefully this uh, is going to be applied to many other BBV treatments so we can really continue to look at kind of efficacy and options and pros and cons of these different maneuvers. Um, so, you know, kind of mentioned that Bandari article already, and I just wanted to kind of say it was nice to see this actually. Her kind of felt like a follow-up almost. I don't know if it was intended to be uh, to yours um, because uh, she did touch on some different anterior canal maneuvers, kind of modeling after them. She did, um, that. the group who wrote that article did state short CRP is useful. Um, so it's nice for them uh, to kind of <laughs> concur uh, with your article. Um, and they did a nice job of um, kind of um, showing that kind of, again, it's nice to see the person doing the maneuver, I will say, at the same time for folks who are kind of trying to learn maneuvers because it kind of helps them, again, to visualize, you know, kind of what, what do I do with the person? What do I, you know, kind of that, that physical learning um, in, a, in a video way rather than only having pictures of different pieces of a maneuver. Sometimes it's nice to just kind of see that maneuver in action. So this is just kind of their video of your short CRP <laughs> and what that looks like and them kind of modeling out why it works, which is what you modeled out as well. So you're both on the same page there, as I say. Um, so it's good to kind of have multiple groups, you know, kind of looking at this and, and you know, 
You don't want any one topic to be only ever studied by one researcher. I'm very sure of that. So you can say, sure. it's not just me saying this. It's not just my opinion here. Even though you're backing it up with your your data, you know, it's nice to have different researchers say, validating, right? That's that's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, right? that's nice. So that's good to, good to see this. So hopefully we'll see more of that. Um, so I would just want to reemphasize in our take home message and then we'll take questions here next. Um, make sure you guys out there are anterior canal assessment. Don't get tricked by those central mimickers. <laughs> okay. Um, use the tips that Dr. Tejido suggested to differentiate. Um, and then you can properly treat it when you do find it, including that sharp CRP. Um, and really explore that BBV viewer so that you can help, uh, you know, bolster your understanding of why and how various treat maneuvers uh, can work. And we're going to jump right into our questions. So here's our first question. Where can I access the semicircular apparatus model in action? I think she's referring to the BPPP viewer. So that is bppviewer.com. I'm actually coming back here because I have a nice slide on resources for you all. You can take a screenshot of this or something if that helps you. And while you're at it, don't forget to check out Dr. Teixeira's YouTube. Uh, he has fantastic videos of different pathologic eye movements for people who are into getting more and more practice watching eye movements and seeing those patterns of pathology, some great an anatomy, and much more on that YouTube channel. And uh, also a very nice uh, discussion between Dr. Teixeira and Dr. Walter on Talk Dizzy to Me on vestibular anatomy from their season two. So be sure to check that out. I've got a short link for you guys there, vfirst.co backslash anatomy. So definitely good uh, call in to that, Robin. Thank you. All right. Another question. If you are having trouble clearing a uh, posterior canal, um, could the otoconia be in the short arm? Would you try the Yakavino or some other maneuver? Like, And I've had those cases where a posterior canal is not clearing with a modified uplier of cement. What is kind of your backup plan? Well, one of the things to consider is, especially if it's a very short response, uh, the, you could have, you can have a short arm posterior canalithiasis. There's a very short uh, arm between the fundus of the utricle and the anterior face of the posterior ampulla. So uh, in order to uh, clear that. Sometimes you, you can put a patient in a release minute, in a release position in which their head is just uh, uh, facing the floor uh, with their, you know, their face sort of hanging off the end of the, the table toward the floor. And uh, <coughs> so that is one possibility if you have disease that you feel like is difficult to clear. Uh, it might be you're not treating the right disease, but uh, we all have these recalcitrant cases, and uh, they, uh, we, they they remain a little bit of a mystery to us. Uh, both cases where we see the nystagmus and we can't clear it, are those patients just continually reloading their canals? You know, we treat them, they're temporarily better, but we can't get a, a durable response. Or um, do they have something going on within the labyrinth anatomically, some narrowing, some, uh, some problem that is preventing the eventual escape of the otolithic debris, which is, and which is in its essence become trapped. Uh, these are all possibilities. Um, we think that some people may have differences that, that there are possibilities that otoliths which dissolve um, may leave behind a protein residue because only 60% uh, of the mass of an otolith is actually mineral. Now the rest is protein uh, that's in a central core. There are four different main proteins in the central core. There are uh, proteins which extend in canals from the central core up to the surface, uh, a net that goes around the surface of the otoconia. 
And in the, in the utricle macula itself, there's another large net, a different protein, which interconnects otoconia. So imagine if you dissolve away the mineral, all that protein is left in the semicircular ducts. And uh, so it's conceivable that you could have uh, uh, con congealed uh, areas that trap od uh, otolith debris that uh, it makes it difficult for it to migrate out. But it's, it's a problem we've all seen. And it's, yeah. and it's mysterious, almost as mysterious as those patients who have a perfect history for otolith disease. We cannot, um, and uh, we don't see nystagmus, but they respond to maneuvers. So uh, BPPV without nystagmus. Yeah, there's been some good articles on that lately. Jeff Walter wants to know, do you feel like doing only a Dix Hall Pike to horizontal limits sensitivity for detection of mild posterior canal BPPV? Yeah, probably. <coughs> uh, I obviously, Jeff uh, did a, wrote a nice uh, article and just demonstrated the loaded um, uh, Dix Hall Pike, which we use in our clinic. We always start with the head. Uh, to, 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 to overcome that, we like to have the patient sit up with their head 30 degrees forward before we take them back to um, horizontal so that we're still getting um, a sort of standard uh, change in angular position, you know, from our, for our expanded Dix Hall Pike maneuver. And of course, uh, uh, we know that uh, Jeff demonstrated that if you do a standard Dix Hall Pike maneuver and you have patients start with their heads 30%, 30 degrees forward, that brings otolith debris probably um, in that uh, fundus of the posterior canal, that flat segment closer to the ampulla. So it will fall farther when you hang the head off the end of the table. You'll have a more robust and a longer lasting response. So it stands to reason that um, if you don't that move the patient as far that you won't get as long uh, or as robust a response. And in extremely mild cases, uh, you might not see a response at all and miss it. So thanks for that question and for the contribution because it's really made a change in our clinical practice. And I think a lot of people are doing it. I completely agree. Um, and we'll kind of have to wrap up because we're over time as usual. Uh, Jeff Walters says great presentation. Bravo to us both. I'll oh, bravo to Jeff for his excellent work, as you say. And thank you, Dr. Tay Shadu, so much for joining us. It was really a pleasure to have you. And um, I hope everybody enjoys this. And any questions afterwards, feel free to put them in the comments of our YouTube. And um, thank you so much, Dr. Tay Shadu. Well, this was a lot of fun, Helena. Thank you so much. Absolutely. All right, everyone. We'll catch you next time.